Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, rent nearly doubles at a City Heights apartment forcing residents to pay up or move out. We're paying a lot of rent and that's why we're sad. They increased the rent by too much and we can't pay. The tenants are handling the increase and in what the management company is doing to help. Plus, a prominent eye doctor at UC San Diego is placed on leave following possible human research violations. What the investigation uncovered. And protecting student military veterans from fraudulent institutions. The push to safeguard their benefits. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Wednesday, April 24th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Tenants at an apartment complex in City Heights are bracing for an unexpected 75% rent increase. KPBS reporter Priya Shreether tells us now many of them are scrambling to find a new place to live. For years, tenants of the Marlboro Plaza apartment complex in City Heights had been paying $1,075 for their two-bedroom apartments. Now, the complex has been sold, and the residents were notified that as of July 1st, their rent would now be increased by $800 to $1,875. The median household income in City Heights is approximately $40,000, $30,000 less than the median income of San Diego, according to city data. For many current residents of Marlboro Plaza, like Anahi, the increase is simply too much. Would you ever be able to afford that rent? I don't think so, no, no, we cool, but we're going to be like so tight yeah. and because all my husband is the, the one that works and I don't, so I always stay with the kids. Many of the residents who didn't want to show their faces out of fear of retribution said families in the 12-unit complex have already started moving out. Nomi says she had lived in the complex for seven years, but moved out over the weekend because she couldn't afford the rent with her wages as a dishwasher. We're paying a lot of rent, and that's why we're sad. They increased the rent by too much, and we can't pay. The property management company Constellation Realty Management responded to questions by email. They said the previous owner did not keep up with maintenance and reasonable rent increases. They said as shocking as the rent increase was as a percentage change, the underlying rent would have been characterized as too good to be true by anybody. They say the new rent reflects the bare minimum it will take to fix the building up and account for new taxes, but they are willing to work with tenants who need assistance or who are interested in transferring to one of their other properties. Priya Shreether, KPBS News. The property management company also says they will help people who may need physical assistance moving and will be flexible with tenants who need extra time to pay the new rent. In a unanimous vote, the city council approves new regulations on dockless scooters. The vote came down last night. The ordinance will limit the speed of scooters in high traffic areas to 8 miles per hour and as low as 3 miles per hour in other places. Scooter companies will be required to use geofencing technology to enforce the speed limits. Since the scooters arrived in San Diego last year, numerous accidents have been reported, which prompted safety concerns from city officials. The city council will vote once more for the regulations to take effect. One of UC San Diego's most prominent eye doctors is now on leave following an investigation by KPBS media partner iNewsource that uncovered possible human research violations. iNewsource investigative reporter Jill Castellano has this update. An iNewsource story last week detailed how Dr. Kang Zhang put people in harm's way for years during several human research studies. Now we have a report with more information from the Food and Drug Administration. It says Zhang poked a hole in a participant's eye with a needle in 2011, which had to be fixed with surgery. That allegedly happened because Zhang was in a hurry to leave for a trip to China. The FDA report also says the participant wasn't even supposed to be enrolled in the study. Dr. Peter Campochiaro is an eye doctor at Johns Hopkins University. He says complications like this can usually be avoided. If you direct the needle wrongly, you could penetrate the lens, and that can cause cataract. And it's a very rare 
complication. So it's not commonly seen, you know, because it's not that difficult to get the injection in the right place. We sent the FDA report to UCSD for comment. A spokeswoman said, quote, Dr. Zhang is currently on leave. UC San Diego is reviewing Dr. Zhang's activities and cannot comment further. For KPBS, I'm iNewsource investigative reporter Jill Castellano. iNewsource is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. Should public university students have access to abortion pills? A California measure proposing so is once again up for debate. Under the proposed bill, the on-campus health centers would be required to offer the medication by the year 2023. Former Governor Brown vetoed the bill last year, but new Governor Gavin Newsom says he would support the measure if it reaches his desk. Lawmakers say the two-pill dosage is a practical option for busy students facing unwanted pregnancies. Only 15% of the closest off-campus abortion providers are open on weekends, meaning that students may have to miss classes, exams, and work to access abortion. The bill cleared the Senate Education Committee earlier this afternoon. Meanwhile, there's a new initiative in San Diego answering the call to attract and keep qualified teachers. A report from the Learning Policy Institute says access to qualified teachers is declining. National University kicked off an effort with local schools and colleges to address the shortage in parts of the county where teachers are needed the most. It's called the Teacher Pathway Inclusion Program. How do we address this issue of the teacher shortage? How do we make it affordable? And uh, how do we make sure that we increase the diversity in our schools, thinking about the entire pipeline? The program helps streamline teachers' education. They can earn their associate degrees from participating community colleges, then move on to earn their bachelor's in teaching credentials from National University for little to no cost. The program also guarantees employment. Congress is stepping up its efforts to protect military veterans and their benefits from fraudulent universities and for-profit schools. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh has details on the new rules. And how should those standards be enforced? Members of the House Education and Veterans Affairs Committees took testimony at Grossmont College Wednesday, looking at issues surrounding for-profit schools. Experts say the schools target veterans and their GI Bill dollars. Representative Susan Davis says she's heard from students enrolled in for-profit schools like ITT Tech, which closed, leaving local veterans on the hook for their student loans. They create a convenience um, for the individual that sometimes within our systems we're not able to match. But on the other hand, what good is convenience if you end up in a worse place than when you started? Robert Muth with the Veterans Legal Clinic at the University of San Diego told members of Congress he represents dozens of veterans who say they've been lied to by private colleges. The VA forced one disabled veteran to repay his tuition when they ruled his school was no longer eligible for loans under the forever GI Bill. Because the school should never have been approved, even though it was approved at the time he was enrolled, he would be responsible for the money that was outlaid by the VA, not the school. The House is looking at several changes, including strengthening the rule which requires a private school to have at least 10 percent of its student body who do not use federal funds. The Obama administration was already in the process of implementing similar rules when the rules were halted by the Trump administration. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. Davis says she's optimistic Congress can tighten the rules sometime within this term. San Diego City Councilwoman Vivian Moreno has been on the job for just a few months after a narrow victory last November. She represents District 8, which includes Barrio Logan, Logan Heights, San Ysidro, and Otay Mesa. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen continues our series on new council members and says Moreno has been keeping busy. Good morning, buenos dias. Her campaign might be over, but Vivian Moreno is still knocking on doors in her district and dropping off flyers. We're going to have a huge cleanup on the 27th at 9 a.m. in Memorial. We're going to have a barbecue and raffle prizes, get to know the community type of deal. Her flyers also have her office phone number and instructions on how to report issues to the city. Soy la regidora. 
Mi nombre es Vivian Moreno. She strikes up a conversation with another resident about curb paint and promises to pass on his complaint. Nos vamos a comunicar con Streets Division para decirles que, que lo quiten. Later in the day, Moreno attends a graduation ceremony for Workshops for Warriors, a nonprofit in Barrio Logan that trains veterans to be welders and machinists. And we're confident that the time and energy you've invested here at Workshop for Warriors will deliver you a, pros a prosperous and rewarding future. Moreno had a tough campaign. She's a Democrat, but the county Democratic Party still put out attack ads suggesting she was a Trump sympathizer, which she definitely is not. Oh, my certificate of, of election as well as my certificate of appointment. She won the election last November over another Democrat by just 549 votes. That slim margin keeps her humble. Well, one of the things that I heard is uh, on the campaign trail walking 8,000 doors was you guys only come out when you guys need something, when you guys want to vote, that's when you guys come out. So I committed to going out to the community, introducing myself uh, to the residents. Congratulations, Council Member Moreno. Thank you. Moreno's transition to council member was smoother than some. She already worked in City Hall in the District 8 office for former city councilman David Alvarez. Her former boss had a rocky relationship with Mayor Kevin Faulkner, but she says her relationship with the mayor is different. It has been fantastic. I have to say, um, we we got along, we get along really well. Um, I'm a very straight shooter, and I think he appreciates that. Um, I'm not afraid to say, hey, I, I'm not going to agree with you on this, but we could work on, you know, other things. Uh, but no, it's been really good. One area of collaboration is housing. Moreno chairs the council's Land Use and Housing Committee and recently advanced a proposal from the mayor that aims to incentivize middle-income housing. She put her own stamp on the proposal with suggested amendments. Moreno says San Diego has to build more homes for future generations. My nieces and nephews are, are part of that population, and it behooves me to make sure that we enact uh, changes, uh, sweeping changes, that, that reforms that will help build more housing. Because essentially we are in the housing crunch that we are in right now because of the policy from, uh, from people that governed before us. Last week, Moreno also voted to advance a new prohibition on people living in cars. In her comments, she asked the mayor's office to limit new homeless services in her district. But she didn't address concerns brought up in public testimony that the proposal would further criminalize homelessness and poverty. I ask her why. I represent District 8, and the calls and the emails uh, that we're getting, um, my um, my response uh, or my comments that day and my vote that day reflect um, what my uh, constituents have asked of me. Do you see people who are homeless who stay in District 8 as your constituents? Um, they do not reside in District 8, so I would say no. Whose constituents are they? I'm not sure. One thing she is sure of is a feeling of responsibility toward young Latinas. Last week, she took part in a foot washing ceremony for Holy Week at her church in Logan Heights. There was a young girl, like literally like nine years old, who was washing my feet. And I just thought like, I, 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 I owe her to be, you know, a good role model and to strive to always do the best for her future, right? And that's something that um, also I, I hold of importance in my heart. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Woodruff tonight on the news hour in light of the Mueller report. We look at what's known so far about foreign plans to interfere in the U.S. 2020 election. Coming up at 7 after evening edition on KPBS. San Diego is the sixth smoggiest city in the nation. That's according to the American Lung Association's State of the Air report, which was released today. It found climate change is making the problem worse because a key ingredient for the creation of smog is heat. The sun cooks vehicle emissions and other organic compounds to create the pollution. San Diego County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher says state lawmakers have more work to do to reduce vehicle pollution, including fighting a federal legal challenge. Those tailpipe emission standards, which are making a bad situation less bad, are under assault from the federal government and Donald Trump. We currently are in litigation 
if we lose that litigation, you are talking about hundreds of millions of cubic tons of new pollution that will enter California. We have to stop the damage and stop the bleeding, and then we have to take decisive action to make it better. El Centro also got some negative attention in this report. The Imperial County City is the nation's eighth worst city for year-round particle pollution, which can cause a number of health problems like asthma. It's warm out there today, and it's only going to get hotter, but for how long? Meteorologist Daji Aswad explains. This morning we started off with low clouds and we'll continue to see that be a trend into tomorrow as well. And then even into tonight, we're going to be looking at some low clouds. But overall, high pressure is in control and that means warm temperatures here across much of the southwest U southwestern U.S. Now, as we head into this weekend and early week, we'll get an upper level trough bringing in a cooling trend. So temperatures will be slightly cooler for your Monday and even look at a chance for showers and thunderstorms as that upper level trough moves on through for the upcoming week. Now for tonight, it's partly cloudy, low of 60. We've been noticing a marine layer still available to us and towards Oceanside, as well as San Diego, many places along the coast, looking at that cloud cover in the late night into the early morning. We're dropping down to 52 in Oceanside, 68 in Borrego Springs, and 49 in Mount Laguna. Better chance for more moonlight as you head further inland. Now as we talk about tomorrow, it is summer-like. It is hot across the southwest. Want to stay hydrated and want to put on the sunscreen to protect yourself from the rays. You're looking at a high of 72 in Oceanside, lower 70s in San Diego uh, for your Thursday, and triple digit temperature in Borrego Springs with a high of 100 potentially, lower 70s into Mount Laguna. And as we continue into your late week forecast, we'll still remain dry across the southwest. No signs of moisture uh, coming in towards San Diego at that point in time. But once again, we'll notice some changes here. High pressure in place for the next several days, Thursday, Friday, uh, looking at some low clouds, a high of 71, some sun on Saturday and temperatures continue to drop into the upper 60s on Monday with a shower at the coast. And that's due to that upper level trough that I continue to talk about. We'll also see that same trend inland tomorrow, a high of 82. It is warm. We're looking at highs cooling down into the upper 70s and then only a high of 69 on Monday for the inland areas. If you're out to the deserts, well, it is hot. Once again, triple digit potential for tomorrow remaining in the 90s. Then we get that cool down on Monday with shower and thunderstorm potential. Also seeing that cool down into the mountains for your Monday high, topping off at 52 degrees. But in the meantime, we'll be looking at a high of 71 for tomorrow in the mountains. Reporting for KBBS News, I'm your meteorologist, Dodgy Swan. Back to you. Right about now, hundreds of people are arriving at San Diego's Liberty Station. It's the third annual Taste of Liberty Station. There's live music, art, and earlier today, one of the featured restaurants gave us a preview of its tastings. We're here at Solari, a highly awarded Tuscan-style Italian restaurant taking part in tonight's Taste of Liberty Station. So we're here now with the executive chef, Filippo, to find out what's on the menu tonight. Oh, tonight we start with the uh, Taste of Liberty Station, uh, so a little uh, Chianti, Tonno del Chianti, which is actually pork and is cured in salt. That's a very labor intensive dish. We have to put the, the meat under salt for two days, it comes out cured. Then we boil on uh, white wine, you can see it comes tender and juicy inside. Then we put under olive oil with bay leaf, juniper berry, rosemary, garlic, and uh, black pepper, extra virgin olive oil, and comes out this delicious dish. But on our menu, there is more, like our famous risotto, truffle, and scallop. Are you excited for tonight's oh, event? Oh, yeah. We're ready for 550, 600 people. So please, come down. Taste of Liberty Station is about more than just the food. Let's find out what else the event has to offer. No one compares. You stand alone. It's, it's 
it's an overall experience. It's not just coming for the food, but you've got people that are surrounding you. We've got a flamingo guitarist in one area. We've got two different jazz trios. We've got a guitar picking trio. We've just got excitement throughout the area, as well as we've got uh, two or three different galleries that are opening their doors, artists who are opening their doors, to be able to come in and to, to showcase their talents as well. Well, what's the, the overall objective? The objective overall for tonight is specifically to open our doors for the restaurants, for the galleries. We're not just um, a, a neighborhood. We're not just a place to, to come to worship, not just a place to send your kids to a great school, but we are a place to explore, and that's the purpose of tonight. Enjoy yourself, come, listen to some great music, and be able to taste some great food. Tell us about the, the tickets and how the sales are going. The tickets are sold out, but I would encourage encourage your uh, viewers to be able to come out and enjoy it. It's going to be a beautiful evening and to be able to experience the um, entertainment themselves. When people come here tonight, whether they have tickets or not, they can still take part and have a great night. They can. They just won't be able to participate with a specific taste, but each one of the restaurants is open this evening. Please come enjoy yourselves. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So once again, all 550 tickets are sold out, but organizers are still encouraging people to go out. There's live music, art, and most eateries are also offering menu items. And here's a tip. Liberty Station is 300 acres and parking options extend throughout the property. From farm to table and from seed to fruit, a growing passion explores the way Southern California grows. Host and garden expert Nan Sturman takes us as she goes along to visit gardens, farms, and even Southern California's Super Bloom. Midday Edition host Jade Hyman spoke with her about the new season. Well, Nan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So season seven premieres tomorrow night. Yeah. Um, you know, tell me, what is the overarching theme uh, for this season? We never have one overarching theme. I mean, the overarching theme is plants in our world. But beyond that, we love to have diversity. So we have all kinds of different stories that all sort of fall under that plants, people, planet, you know, that umbrella that we're doing this season. And, you know, Earlier this week, we did an entire show on Earth Day, and one of the things we talked about was composting. Uh, what did you learn about that? Because I know you did an episode on the same thing. Well, we did an episode of composting a number of years ago, and um, composting is so diverse. We talk about it as one thing. It's a process, but that process is carried out under so many different kinds of conditions, at home, in industrial settings, on farms, nurseries, you know, there's the fact that you can compost anything that's organic, basically, anything that's animal or vegetable, um, and do it in so many ways and reduce the impact on our, our um, landfills and reduce greenhouse gases and all those things. I mean, composting seems like a very simple thing to do, but it has huge ramifications. Mm. And, you know, in all of the places that you take us uh, along in your episodes, um, it really does, I'm sure, inspire a lot of people to want to do gardening of their own. Space, though, is limited in many places here in San Diego. Can you do a garden anywhere? And, and how do you work around the space issue? Well, it's interesting you ask that because one of our favorite episodes this, this season, one of the last episodes, in fact, we just finished shooting yesterday, is on community gardens. So if you don't have room to do it at home or you have a small patio, you don't have enough sunlight or you just don't want to do it by yourself, there are 80, more than 80 community gardens around San Diego. And they're of every variety, size, price point you can imagine. And they're wonderful because they're places where literally the community comes together and they build community. And if you don't know how to garden, the people in the garden will teach you, whether formally or informally. And given everything that you've learned and everything that you know about gardening, what's the key to having a successful garden? Patience. Patience. Because gardening is so much trial and error. It's so much letting things happen, watching what's happening, understanding, observing, figuring out what the issues are. Everybody wants to reach for the bottle of X to solve Y problem. Don't do that. What is the problem? Is there really a problem? Somebody sent me a photo recently of a, a citrus, lemon or orange leaf, and they had aphids on it. 
and they wanted to know what to treat it with, and I said nothing. Because among those little white aphids were some little white balls, solid balls. They were not transparent, they were more translucent. Those were aphids that had been parasitized by a wasp. This is the natural control for aphids. The wasp lays their eggs in those little aphids. The eggs hatch and they eat the aphids from the inside out. So they were basically growing their own pesticide right there. If they'd sprayed it or washed those aphids away, they would have destroyed the natural balance in their garden. But they didn't have to do anything. It was happening right there in front of them. They just didn't recognize it. Those are the things that we need to pay attention to. What's happening in my garden? What's, what's going right? If things are going wrong, what is the problem? And then how do I solve that problem or do I even need to? Is it really a problem? Who knew that gardening could be a life lesson in patience? Oh my God, the biggest. The only thing that's a bigger life lesson than, than the garden in terms of patience, having children. <laughs> Nan Sternman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Once again, season seven of A Growing Passion premieres tomorrow night right here on KPBS. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. And thanks for joining us. Have a great night.